Hi, and welcome to another video about Andor. I'm Father Roderick, I'm a priest and I'm a geek, and I love to talk about Star Wars, and not just about lightsabers and cool spaceships, but also about the deeper meaning of the Star Wars stories, all these layers. To remind you of what this episode was about, I found a recap. This time, I'm reading the recap from ReadySteadyCut.com. The announcement, episode 7, settles into a slower rhythm to deal with the fallout. News of the Balsy Act of Rebellion is everywhere, for better and for worse, emboldening some and terrifying others. But there is a clear sense that the mission was a turning point in the timeline. The ISB, for instance, that's the Imperial Security Bureau, they have been reassured by Palpatine, yes, he was mentioned in this episode, that a Senate hearing will be convened to grant them additional powers, which Miro thinks is playing in the hands of the burgeoning rebel movement. So Dedra is warning the Empire, like, this is exactly what the rebels want. They want us to believe that this is a robbery, that this is just part of, you know, just random acts of, of rebellion. But she sees the connections and she feels that, no, the rebels are onto something. They are doing this systematically and they are taking our valuable equipment and now also money to fund something way bigger. It is a threat, but of course, no one believes her. So what I also liked about this first part of the story is that the Empire has this same knee-jerk reaction that it has always shown in the past and that they will also do later on in A New Hope and in Empire Strikes Back, and that they react with more oppression, more violence. They literally used the metaphor at one point of clenching your fist, tightening your grip, and we know what Leia says about that. It won't help, but it's the only way that they know how to react. But maybe Dedra is going to show us that there is also an alternative way to deal with the rebellion. Meanwhile, Mon Mothma suspects Luthen and isn't happy about A, the fact that she had no knowledge of the operation in the first place, we're talking about the Aldani operation, and B, the potential ramifications on her position as a senator. An Imperial Star Destroyer floats ominously over Aldani. This is, of course, the famous shot of the teaser trailer. I was hoping that we got to see it. And, and then, of course, this, this huge Star Destroyer, accompanied by small groups of TIE fighters, shows that the Empire is, is reacting with more power. We hadn't seen any stormtroopers yet on Aldani, but we hear in, in the episode, in the background, that they've already um, arrested hundreds of people on Aldani as a retaliation, and now they're sending in this big Star Destroyer just like they did on Jeddah later on in Rogue One. It's literally showing off their power. This is a Star Destroyer. We are here hovering over you. You cannot escape our grip. A very menacing, very cool, very cool scene. The good news is that word of the attack is getting to the people, and the people are beginning to believe in something bigger than themselves. So the heist on Aldani becomes almost like a rallying cry to people that may, up until that moment, may not have been willing to join the rebellion. But now people are seeing that there are actually groups of rebels that are dealing a blow to the Empire, and that is encouraging. So this may actually be the beginning of more people joining the Rebellion, because at this point in history, the Rebellion is still pretty small, very poor, as we've seen, and they have no money, they don't have much, they don't have any ships yet. But that may be about to change. So the people start to believe that there is a chance that you can resist the empire's totalitarianism and that it's actually worth rising up against the oppressor. But there's still plenty of work to be done. Miro is fortunate that she was the only person to have picked up on the evidence of that work being done in the first place since it strengthens her position. She might flirt with the rules somewhat in amassing reports of missing avionics outside of her own jurisdiction, but when the matter is raised officially by Blevin 
she not only gets the props for using her initiative, but also gets to take over his duties. She is quietly positioning herself as one of the show's primary antagonists. I love that, by the way. This whole power play was maybe my favorite part of, of the episode, especially the dialogue there. Um, so you th Blevin thinks that he's going to win by basically ratting out what Dedra is doing. And yeah, she is ignoring the rules, but she has so much more vision. She displays courage, and that is also perceived by her superiors. Although she does get that warning, watch your back. So you know that Blevin is going to try to thwart her plans, or worse, maybe she's going to get herself killed if she's not careful. It just shows you what a great group of friends the Empire actually constitutes. We also begin to see how allies can turn into potential enemies very quickly, as Luthen's assistant, Clea, clandestinely meets with Vel and orders her to tie up the loose end that is Cash in Andor. This was the most shocking moment, because now apparently there are also rebels that want to go after Cashin and get him out of the way because Cashin, of course, as a mercenary, is now a liability. Who can tell that he's going to keep quiet about what happened there during the heist? Maybe for the proper amount of money he is willing to rat out the rebels. It's understandable, but I never thought that they would go this far by portraying the rebels also as being a threat to Cashin. They're not that likable in this episode. Definitely not ideal for Cashin himself, who never particularly wanted to be involved in the uprising in the first place. And that isn't the only way in which Cashin's involvement in the mission backfires on him. With word of the raid spreading, the people of Ferex, including Marva, his foster mother, are beginning to believe in the viability of resistance, and Cashin's adoptive mother wants to remain behind on Ferex to fight, despite the fact that he now has enough money to take them literally anywhere else. Cashin is forced to leave without her, without anyone, for that matter. This was definitely the most emotional part of the story and of the episode. Heartbreaking. He goes back to his mother, and he is so proud of what he has done. Mom, I finally have the money. Let's get out of here. And then his mother is like, no, I am staying here. I believe in the rebellion. Why would I continue to give the Empire what it wants? It's time to rise up. She shows, I think, a very courageous example to her son. But of course, Cashin doesn't believe in the rebellion yet. He wants to just live the easy life. He's got plenty of money. And I would say, you know, in the gospel, you have Jesus talking about the narrow gate and then the paved road, right? So most people always go for the easy route. But if you really want to be a follower of the rebellion that is Jesus in a certain way, because, yeah, he was definitely considered to be a rebel by the established powers of those times. But if you want to follow the rebellion that he is about to start, you have to go through the narrow gate. It's not easy. And here, Cashin is definitely going for easy and for safe. He just wants to get out of that awful place. And who can blame him? He's suffered, and his mother has suffered from the Empire. He's got his reasons to hate the Empire, but he doesn't want to fight the Empire because he knows that the power is too overwhelming. He doesn't believe that the rebels are strong enough. And he has reasons, actually, to not believe that because he's seen these rebels and he knows that it's just a ragtag group of people that hardly know what they're doing. They're just winging it. If it hadn't been for Cashin, they would have totally been uh, obliterated. So, yeah, you can't blame him, but of course we know that it's the wrong thing to do. And I admired his mother. Even though she's old, she has courage. And that is something that is more valuable than anything else. But, but Cashin doesn't listen, and he doesn't follow his mother. And so you get that breakup. What I also love structurally, story-wise, what they do here, is to create this contrast between two sons and two mothers here. We see Cyril Karn back with his mom, totally obedient, and his mother is just finding him the most awful job in the galaxy. It's this bureaucratic, stupid desk job. But isn't that a way also for her to tell her son, I don't believe in you? She is projecting, right? She's criticizing 
Cyril's fancy clothing, because just like he did with his costume, he had his regular clothes also be upgraded and tailored. And then his mother is telling him, you just do that because you're insecure about your position. But of course, it's his mother who lacks faith and lacks ambition and lacks the confidence in her son. I was feeling so bad for Cyril. And you know that he is destined for something much, much bigger. But then he will have to dare to step away from his mother, which he doesn't dare right now. Cashin and his mother, Marva, it's the opposite almost. Here it's the mother who wants to challenge her son to be brave, to stand up against the empire, do the right thing. And it's Cashin who just settles for this, this simple life on a like a planet that, that feels a bit like Miami, you know? He's just going to the beach and wants to just be a tourist. And of course, that doesn't work. The empire is there too. There is no place where you can escape from the grip of the empire because they want total domination. There is no other way than rebellion or submission. But Cashin leaves his mother behind and he's losing the few people that he called friends. And what does he get in return? Well, this is where things get worse for Cashin. While he's hiding out on Niamos, that's the... Miami planet, at a nice beachside resort, he's accosted by a shore trooper, which was so cool because we got introduced to the shore troopers in Rogue One. I've got a couple of friends in the 501st, the Dutch garrison division of the 501st, and there are a few people that actually made that entire shore trooper costume. I know that they're jumping up and down now that this costume makes a return in the Andor series. It's a very cool costume, a very cool outfit. But not only do we get to see a shore trooper, but there is a KX droid that may or no, may not be K2SO before being reprogrammed. I'm sure that it is K2SO, but you get to see the menacing side of this droid. Oh my gosh, that confrontation between the two and just the sheer size of these of these droids, unbelievably cool. You get to see the injustice of the Empire. There's this one judge, female judge, and she's just eating nuts, and she's clearly totally not interested in all the little thieves that she has to send to prison. And then to make it even worse for her, there is this guy who says, I'm just a tourist, and he's basically not complying. And so she sends him to prison for six years for an offense that she actually tells Cashin normally would only get six months. But because you resist, because you're a loudmouth, six years. There is no justice there. What kind of judge does that? There is no process. There is no proof. In fact, when they read the charges, the people that arrested Cashin have amplified it and there he's being convicted for crimes that he didn't even commit. But it shows you from the perspective of Cashin, who we kind of care for, that this is something that is happening all across the galaxy. So imagine what this does to the parents of children that get condemned like this, the relatives and the colleagues and the friends of people that get sent to jail like that without any due process, without any type of real justice. This, this is what actually is the nesting ground for the rebellion. It's not just the violent stormtroopers and the big star destroyers. No, it's this day-to-day -day injustice, the oppression of the little people. There is no place where you can be safe. So there is no other response than rebellion. Um, so he is now in prison. And that's where the episode ends. The perfect cliffhanger. And now, of course, we want to see what happens to Cashin. I want to definitely see what happens to Dedra. I want to see... What happens to Cyril? Because we ultimately see him with his desk job and you see him look up almost in desperation. You know that he's not going to stay there. So I want to see what happens to him. I want to see what happens to Marva. 
I feel like that can only end in a very, very bad way. Maybe that will be the wake up call for Cashin, but how can he even stay in touch with his mother when he's in prison? <sighs> I definitely want to see more of all the story arcs. These writers know so well what they've been doing for six episodes. And now we're going to see where that all leads. This is what the series needed. And I'm glad that we get to see this uh, at the halfway point. Those were my thoughts. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this episode. I do a weekly podcast for my patrons over at patreon.com slash fatherroderick where I talk about anime. I do these deep dive analysis episodes about Star Wars series and movies. And you also get to help me with my work here on social media. Thanks. Talk to you later and may the force be with you.